Little incidents shape public perceptions. Perceptions shape policy. Policy shapes our state, which is why it is so very significant. As Colorado continues to debate the role of energy production, so important that the house explosion in Firestone that killed two people last week has now led to the voluntary shutdown of thousands of oil wells across northern Colorado. Now, it might turn out that the old vertical well about 200 feet from the house that blew up was not related to the explosion in the Oak Meadow subdivision. But Anadarko Petroleum is concerned enough about the possibility or the publicity that it is temporarily shutting down 3,000 similar wells for reinspection, focusing first on those that are closest to homes and businesses. Family members of the two men who were killed in the explosion say they suspected that it was an issue with a water heater. Fire investigators tell us they're confident about the cause, but they're not going to say anything until they're absolutely certain. It began two years ago this week. It was headline news for months. A series of mysterious shootings in northern Colorado along roads and highways. Two men died and a woman was hurt. Time passed. Headlines became passing mentions, became silence. Silence that does nothing for the families left wondering all this time. It does nothing for the investigators who told our Steve Steger that just one tip could still put this to rest for everyone. John Jacoby's name is literally etched on the town of Windsor. John loved riding his bike. He loved this community. Wherever you look, there's something um, that reminds us of uh, what John meant to us. The town made a fitting memorial for the man known to ride his bike just about everywhere. A place where John's brothers now like to sit and reflect. We can't ever get John back, but we're going to really turn this into a positive for, for us and the town and, and everybody else involved. His memory lives on. He was a tremendous athlete. Much like the memory of Bill Canole. If he did have a negative thought about someone or something derogatory, he kept it to himself. Bill's sister Mary he has a those. hard time keeping negative thoughts to herself. I feel sad that it's not done and that we can't look at the guy and go, you son of a b what's your problem? You know, do you know what you've done? Closure is something you never really feel in a case like this. Both Billy and John were shot and killed in 2015 by someone. That's about all police who have been working on this case for nearly two years can now say. As Billy and John's stories have faded from the headlines, tips to the Northern Colorado Shooting Task Force have slowed down. But it still exists. Right now, there is no end date. The task force still exists for these uh, families. So they, they keep us um, apprised uh, about every couple of months. I'm grateful for any tip, any time somebody feels compelled to report information. Closure is one of the things we always talk about in cases like this. The truth is, it's an unattainable feeling. Billy and John's families are just searching for comfort. The important thing is to find this person, get him off the street, and so it doesn't happen again. That was Steve Steger reporting. John Jacoby's neighbors called him Windsor's ambassador of happiness in that town. And his spirit lives on each year through a fundraising run in his memory. The event on Saturday is raising money for a scholarship in his name at the high school. If your boss fires you for being gay, that's illegal. If Karen Olivito gets fired for being gay, that's religion. The reverend from Denver who made history as the first openly gay United Methodist bishop is no less of a bishop or any more gay than she was when she got the job. But someone in her church complained. Now Olivito's fighting to remain a bishop and to convince non-Methodists that this is their fight too. I think it's going beyond the church walls because it's, it's where we are as a society right now. I think we're seeing such great divisions being created between people, and the world is looking for a sign of hope. The Methodist Church's equivalent of the Supreme Court could decide if she'll keep her title by the end of the week or so. Remember when Bon Jovi chose New York over Denver and canceled his show here earlier this month? At least everybody got a refund. Colorado's popular Lantern Festival keeps jerking people around with no refunds or resolution in sight. Since our first report that the Lantern Festival had been canceled, rescheduled, moved, kicked down the calendar, we've been hearing from more and more of you who just want a refund. We explained that the Lantern Festival is likely to never happen again in Colorado because of fire codes that are on their way into the books. 
Well, now the organizers have gone radio silent on us as well. The best that we can advise is to reach out to the Lantern Fest directly, not the website where you bought the tickets. You can write to them info at thelanternfest.com. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask them nicely for a refund. Not that us asking nicely got us any answers, but we'll let you know if this escalates to the level of an official investigation. The anti-fracking activists from Boulder County who suggested blowing up wells and eliminating energy workers is now asking for protection. Yet Andrew O'Connor ratcheted up the rhetoric again today, telling the website coloradopolitics.com that he wouldn't have a problem with snipers shooting workers at a fracking site. When I asked O'Connor on the phone if he really condoned assassinating oil and gas workers, he hung up. But get this, I called him because yesterday we reported that the Secretary of State's office wanted extra security for his anti-fracking ballot measure hearing coming up because of his comments about bombing wells and eliminating workers. Well, we found out that Connor O'Connor is now asking that his hearing be held by telephone, saying that he fears for his own safety. Twice in the last month, or in the last year rather, moms in Highlands Ranch have taken their lives and killed their children. Now another mother thinks that she might be able to link up moms one-to-one -to, -one to prevent problems from passing the point that they feel insurmountable. Nikki Brooker launched her support system today. She's calling it, You Are Not Alone, Mom to Mom. Free get-togethers for moms who will be paired up with other mothers for advice and help. Someone to talk to as life throws curveballs and some parents feel they can't cope. And very few consider the worst. It really rocked me to my core to the point that I said, we can't just sit by and let this happen. We can't let this happen to another kiddo. So it's time for us to stand up as moms and support each other and be there for each other. The group timed its launch for a few days before May when mental health issues are going to be spotlighted nationwide. They're hoping more people will then be open to a difficult conversation. Speaking of tough discussions, drug addiction is one that we have not shied away from here on this program. Last Friday, we introduced you to a mother named Lindsay who lost custody of her kids and barely survived her heroin addiction. And each such story on our air brings even more to our inbox. Stories that show that there are as many paths out of addiction as there are paths in. Here's Kevin's story. When I was in elementary school, I was the kind of kid that everyone always picked on and beat up and had no friends. And to make friends, uh, I started using drugs and the more drugs I did, I started to notice the more friends I had. I'm Kevin Zwak, and I was addicted to heroin for five years. Uh, it's a lot more addicting than you think. I mean, yeah, I know people that have tried it and didn't like it, but there's lots of people out there like me that you try it once and you're hooked. All my depression, all my anxiety would just take all that away. And I mean, when I first started using, I just slept all my worries away. I never cared anything about anything. I never had anything to worry about. All I worried about was using. And I used several different types of pills for several years and never, never had any problems with those. Um, it was when I got to the heroin, it was once and done, I was hooked. If I would have known that I could get help to get sober, then I would have gotten sober way sooner. I saw all my friends around me, they had insurance and everything going to rehab, and I thought because I didn't have insurance or any way to pay for it, that I was just doomed. I was left to deal with it on my own. Finally, after searching and searching and searching, finding somewhere that would actually pay for me to go to rehab, and once I did that, then it was more so just uh, getting scared of, being scared of living sober, which actually, I'm glad I got over that fear of getting sober because life has only gotten so much better. So the reason I'm here is to share my story with everyone out there and to let them know that there is hope and even for people who can't afford it and who don't have insurance, there is help out there for you. So where to start with that help if you or someone you know needs it? This article on 9news.com in the next session has some suggested resources to hopefully at least point the way in the right direction.
I'm gonna say it softly now so no one freaks out, okay? Snow. It's coming. Sleep in Saturday morning, it'll be like it never happened. Maybe you want to revel in the worst of weather, like the hundred or so Rockies fans left at Coors Field after last night's marathon. Two of them tell us about a very personal baseball experience. And if Denver's gonna grow, and it is, where? It's not a game, except that it is, and you can play too, next. You would not expect a growth spurt at age 158, but Denver is split in its pants, stretching its shirts, and has toes poking out of its shoes. City planners are preparing for an additional 250,000 new Denverites by 2040. And you know you can't just put them all in more shiny Lodo Towers. That is not how the game is played. Each one of these squares is a little bit over 50 acres. City Park is right here. There's a lot, a lot of trade-offs. It's the growing a better Denver game. In stores now. Not really, but the city does want the game in your hands, putting an imagined future of the city in your hands. It's like SimCity. <laughs> I wish it looked that smooth. Without all the fancy animations and graphics. It sounds like a lot, but Denver is projected to grow anywhere between 70 and uh, 128,000 housing units by 2040. In a city where the unofficial bird is the crane, this is anything but a game. So like here? Yeah, sure. It's meant to help current residents understand the difficulties of where future residents will go. If you don't want them in your part of town, then where? And what consequences will that cause? This is an opportunity to hear everyone's thoughts about what their choice is for Denver's future. So say I live in the Highlands and I don't want any more people living in the Highlands. Do you have stickers for people to be like, this is not what I want to live in? We're done and no more. <laughs> we'll be actually taking notes on those type of things. The stickers indicate where you want the new construction and what type. It was medium, so that would result in 500 housing units. This game, believe it or not, has a take home version. We're looking at you, NIMBY crowd, whose backyard should get developed and what then happens as a result. Build more dense housing near light rail on a new bus route. Cherry Creek, Stapleton, middle of downtown. If we would happen to see more growth in the suburbs, that may have negative consequences to things like commute times, air quality, even water consumption. If we see more development in the city center, for example, we may need to be investing more in uh, amenities like parks, improved transit service, rec centers, libraries that we need to be planning for in the future. There is an online version of the game as well as a physical board game that you can reserve and play. All the information is in this story on the next section of 9news.com. Hey, we promised you updates on the Coloradans who are climbing Mount Everest. We live vicariously through their strength and determination. Here you go. Here's Jim Davidson. This is video he posted today crossing a crevasse on a ladder. He's at 20,500 feet on Everest. It was two years ago yesterday that an earthquake hit the Himalayas, killing 22 people at Everest Base Camp. Jim was attempting to summit the mountain at that time, and this week he burned incense in memory of those who are lost. Mike Hogan, an Eagle Crest High School teacher, is also hanging out on Everest, waiting for the jet stream to shift so that he can make a run at the summit. Mike says until that point, his group just has a bit more time to adjust to the altitude in the thin air. We will be keeping you updated on Colorado's climbers. We're back shortly with a sign that someone is taking traffic law into their own hands. And your feedback next. It's a sign, a custom one, spotted outside Eagle Ridge Elementary School in Lone Tree. No parking anytime. All right, you've seen these before. Look closely, though. Left side, that arrow looks legit. Right side, no, that is an amateur arrow that somebody stuck up there in tape. Would have fooled me passing in a car. Looks like somebody really wants to limit the parking across from the school. Jay Keen writes in with a thank you for our reporting on addiction issues, writing you're saving lives with this very personal style of reporting. We certainly hope so. Edwin Williams says next, best show on TV. Did you start it? Well, yeah, me and the whole team. You got Linda and Steve and Carrie and Cody and Aaron, and then you got the folks in charge. You got Mark and Steve and, and Christy and Patty. So it's been a whole team effort. We'll get back at it next time.